point. Um, lead, lead us must know the end game. That's right. Know what to where they're going to. Thank you so much, my brother Thomas. All right. Point number three. What are the three Ps? The first P is people. People group, right? We've got to have a clear people group that we're reaching out to. Number two. Prayer. 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 Mining at the same time. Okay. <coughs> Scenario mining. Last P. Personal involvement. Very good. And the only constant is change. Change. Constant is change. All right. Quick point number five. Is the uh, is that a true picture of an Adventist church? No. no. It doesn't die. Right. It goes into what? Coma. <laughs> into coma. That's right. That's what a real picture of life. So the, the 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 key is this. When you see a chart like this. What you find is that it's the same pattern that we don't want to have. Well, thank you, sister. All right. The key is this: when you have a when you have an organization like this and it grows, right? The key is that you don't want it to go to a plateau and to decline. Generally, this point, this area here, in most organization, is the seventh and eighth of year. It's around that time. Uh, Normally, uh, so at this point in time, it either it renews its vision, or it will gradually plateau and decline. So we, what, what needs to happen is that it needs to be a renewed vision, and then it needs to renew vision again and renew vision again. You understand what I'm saying? So a mission statement stays constant pretty much because we exist as some Baptist church to fulfill the, the Great Commission in the context of the Three Angels' Message. But our vision will change over time. And we need to renew vision in churches. If we don't, we will gradually plateau and decline. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, because we are a denominational system, it really doesn't go down, it actually levels off in a state of coma. <laughs> They need ventilator, that's right. <laughs> they need a life support system. <laughs> they need, they need uh, to pump in money there, they need mission to send workers there. You know, that's, that's a problem. Yes, we want to wake you up. Okay, point number six we did not cover, but it's a key point. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and the most urgent need of our, all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. To seek this should be our first work. Very hard to teach about setting up pancreas in a church that firstly needs revival. Very hard to teach about uh, a church to do evangelism if it doesn't do revival first. Revival by the Holy Spirit, by the Word, is very important. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessings of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow His blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him, then our earthly parents to give good gifts to the children. Parents really want to give gifts to the children, don't they? But God even more so would like to give gifts to us. Point number seven, we are standing on the very borders of the eternal world. We have no time to lose. There should be what? Well-organized. A well-organized plan for the employment of workers to go into all our churches, large and small, to instruct their members how to labor for the upbuilding of the church, and also for unbelievers. Those who labor in visiting the churches should give their brothers and sisters instructions in practical methods. Mm. Practical method of doing missionary work. I, I think this is so critical. Honestly, um, when I invite speakers to our church to do training, um, we are very particular. I ask the question often, where, where did they apply this? Did the instructors, are the instructors practitioner of what they say, or are they just theorists of what they say? It is so important to, uh, to select uh, speakers, and we, we make particular attention. For example, we may want to uh, have a training class on how to give Bible study. Has that person really have experience in giving Bible study, and won souls by giving Bible study? Or that person has just read a few books and put together a training course on that? When we want a person to teach on church planting, and that person really plant any churches, right? It's so important to look for practitioners uh, who are spiritual um, teachers that we can call upon to, to teach. So 
over the years, one of the big things that we have put emphasis on is that when we put our training school online, rightly trained, every single instructor there, we review the video that goes upon it. We are quite particular because we want to make sure we put good training resources together. We try to look for practitioners who are soul winners, who are, who are church planters, who are disciple makers, who are, you know, who are gurus in their areas, who, who really know their stuff because they not just um, they have a, a longevity in service, but because they actually practice what they do. All right, so look for that um, as a church leaders as you plan your, your training over the next uh, few years. Okay, all right. Now, we're going to point number eight today. And uh, before we get into that, I'm going to start again with prayer. I just did a just purely a recap. But let's, let's get into prayer that we can ask the Lord to guide our study together again. Father, we're going to learn about how to turn the concept of vision and values into practice, to practice in a local church. How do we make it happen? Why do we make it happen? Father, we need your guidance and we need your spirit to guide our thoughts. As we learn together, may you teach us. Father, as we learn, give us an open heart to learn, an open mind by your spirit is to feel. So pour your spirit upon your churches here that is represented here. That we may go away refreshed and renewed and ready to go. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I talk about the cycle of evangelism. I talk about the need to um, have a schedule on how we plan our calendar for the year. And when you, if you think of it carefully, I also talked about a closed loop model. Do you remember the closed loop that starts going from uh, um, from uh, meeting the person to, uh, to bridging programs and so on? We had a closed loop. Generally, the closed loop follows the, the, the cycle of evangelism. Do you understand the link between the two? There is a link between the closed loop and the cycle of evangelism. If you're not familiar with closed loop, it's point number in in your, in your notes, there's a picture of a closed loop evangelism, right? That cycle then generally follows the funnel. Because when you look at a funnel like this, the funnel, if you, it, it starts very big. So that when you sow, we meet a lot of people. You may run a children nutrition program. You meet hundreds of people. And so we generally call this uh, contacts. They're just contacts on, right? And then they may show some interest. They begin to come to your category, they begin to come to your parenting center, they begin to come to your, 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 your business class, whatever. So they become interest. So the number maybe you may have hundreds here, they become less here because the context turn into interest. And then the interest start to have Bible study, they become your Bible students. And then you bring them to evangelistic meeting. Then they become um, people who are doing your Bible studies, people who uh, begin to do, um, 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 you know, attending your, your visitors Bible study class, whatever you're doing to follow up on the evangelistic meeting. And then they become baptismal candidates, you understand? So that, but the numbers get less and less and less. And finally they're baptized and then you, you disciple them. And then you train them to be a worker. So it's like a funnel from more to less. That's why it looks like a, a, a farmer's funnel, we call it. So, it goes from sowing, cultivating, harvesting. In our ministry, um, maybe different from yours, depending on your school calendar and depending on your, your festivity dates in your country, every country is different. There's no point running evangelistic meetings, for example, for us during Christmas time, because uh, our universities are closed, our public group, the universities and the young adults, they go on holiday, they go vacationing everywhere. So, no point running evangelistic meeting for us during Christmas time. So, we pick a time that fits for us. So we will run it somewhere around this time, in this, this time period. For us, the yearly calendar for us is February to April, is our sowing time. May to June is our cultivating time. Around July, August, we will have one of this time, we will have one of the months here, we have evangelistic meeting, and then we will have nurturing program uh, to go to disciple and to equip and to prepare for the new year again. So every year our cycle repeats. So when we go to church board meeting, because our board members know what cycle of evangelism is, and we've taught that, we've preached that, we've teach that, we will always ask every ministry to work towards this same goal. So music ministry, why are you running a concert here? Why don't you run it earlier so you can invite people to the concert, 
and then we can meet more contacts and bring them to maybe to a guitar class or a violin class maybe because you invite all your friends and they say, wow, look at the kids in the church, they all could play violin. Can we have a, can my kids learn violin from you guys? Right, so maybe you bring them to a violin class. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is very intentional. The concept is not just there for the sake of having it there. It's part of the cycle of evangelism. Alright, so we work the cycle this way. So for example, we run community service, we run camp, we run social, sporting events, literature ministry, health program. We run all that during that time. And then, you may choose your own bridging programs. You may have a variety of bridging programs that your church would run. And then after that, we will run, we we'll invite them to care group, we'll do visitations, we'll do Bible studies, right? We've, 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 we're cultivating the interest here. Is that, is that clear? Alright, and then after the evangelistic meeting is done, we'll do, bring them to care group again, we'll do visitation again, we'll do discipleship teams, we'll do Bible studies, and we'll do training for the newly baptized. So our cycle works pretty much like this in, in, our, in our church calendar um, on a yearly basis, on a yearly basis. So it is not something that we, we, don't, we don't just go and say, okay, let's pull out um, the 2013 calendar and let's see what we can fill in the calendar this year. Uh, okay, you all ministry department, please report to the next board meeting what you want to do. Okay, bring a calendar for you, bring a calendar for women, Ministry, bring a calendar for Pathfinders, and then we'll try to make it work, okay? And then everybody fight in the next board meeting. I want this one, I want this one, right? It becomes a very complicated, very frustrating process in church board. So we don't want that kind of process. We want to teach the cycle evangelism, we want to teach the funnel, and we want to teach that from a biblical standpoint, and we want the ministries to go away thinking. So if Pathfinder wants to run a camp here, we go like, is that harvest? Pathfinder. It's not a harvest, it's harvest time. So when we do the harvest, everybody gets hands into the harvest. When the farming community gets into harvest, everybody gets involved in harvest. So Pathfinder, you want to run your camp? Run it somewhere out here. Meet the parents, meet the, meet the kids, invite the kids to your Pathfinder club. Meet them every week and run a parents meeting during Pathfinder club and bring them to evangelistic meeting. You understand? Run a parenting seminar here and then bring them to evangelistic meeting. So use Pathfinder as a means for so many. And I tell you, your young people in Pathfinder will find more meaning in Pathfinder than just learning and getting all those badges. I think that it makes Pathfinder more exciting. Because really, we study the history of youth movement. AY movement. Actually, it's called MB and JMB. You remember that? It is all about missionaries, teaching our young people to be missionaries. But today, we call it AY, and I almost forgot the idea of missionary in there. We've got to come back to the basics. What we used to do. Come back to the, the actually it's not a new paradigm, it's an old new paradigm. It's a, it's a paradigm that's old but it's actually new again for us, you know what I mean? So the New Testament paradigm. So what we do is that after we have uh, we have one ministry in our church um, that deals with students and this is at one of our campuses, one of our outreach. So they have a theme for their for their university outreach. They call it HD, HD program or high distinction program. Alright, so High Distinction is a program that reaches out to students. We, we want to teach students, uh, so some of the programs are like high performance seminars. Uh, you know, um, uh, Charge Your Life, um, uh, High Country, High Country is a camping trip, so they go up to the mountains, yeah, right? So anything starting the word high, so they brand it as HD. So they make, uh, uh, they, the HD is an excellence, balance and fulfillment. HD is a year-long program to help you to realize your best, your body, mind, and your spirit. Right? This is a program that reaches out to the university. And around here is a cycle evangelism calendar. So they, they marked out all the sewing programs, they marked out all the cultivating programs, they marked out they're going to run an evangelistic meeting here, and then they marked out they're going to do all the training program here. And this is, their, this is the calendar for that ministry, reaching out. This is our Gateway East Church. Of this congregation. So the calendars are, is, are, are intentional. We don't just design for the sake of just filling spots so that there's no clash between ministries, but all ministries work towards this. Does that make sense? Question. Yes. How early do you need to do planning prior to this calendar? Very much in the January, February time frame, we're going to do all this. Yeah. So we, we try to do this uh, before the, the year starts. But generally, we would do it around um, January, February time frame. 
do all this. We've got to get all the ministries together. Now, I know sometimes Norman community finish so late, right? And that's one of the problems that we need to address. I'll talk about Norman community later this afternoon and how we improve that process. But around January, probably, we need to plan that. Now, we plan this yearly calendar. We plan this yearly calendar with the vision in mind. Do you understand? Because the vision goes beyond Vision goes beyond yearly. It goes. It may run three, uh, run five years. That vision may run in your church. So, but you need to translate vision into yearly things so that you head towards the vision. Otherwise, there's a disjoint between vision, which is a nice one to put in your bulletin, but nobody cares about it, you know, and your calendar. Because the real thing, the the, 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 the real measure whether your vision is working is that your calendar of activities and your resources and your money match the direction of your vision. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So translating that to this is what was required. So, um, yes, let's see what else. Okay. okay. So, for example, I was preaching in. Other? Yeah. yeah. Question. To clarify, because the cultivation is in May to June, it actually starts in May all the way up to harvest, right? Not just May to June. Oh, yeah, you're correct. So, let's say if I pick August to be my evangelistic program, then you run May all the way to August. Yeah. But actually, you know what? During the evangelistic meeting, the focus is harvest, but it will be 80% harvest, but you still get 20% new people coming. And that will you still be sowing. But you carry them through to the next evangelistic meeting. Yeah. So that will happen. Good question. Any other questions? Yes? What's the minimum number of workforce people that you need to run this? Um, the minimum? Yeah. We started off with 20 people. So, you know, but you do what you can do. If you are a group of 20 people, you only choose one people group. That's all you can do. And you can put the things in there. You might do the things that you can do good work and well at. But if you if just grow more, you can do, do, you know. Like now, we have 120 for each, you know, 100 to 120 per congregation. Then what will happen is that we will only do two people groups. And we'll do the things that we can, can deal with, we can deal with. So, if you have 20 people church or 30 people church, your resource is limited. And so you can only do limited things. So you might not be able to do all these, all these bridging programs. You might just say, we're going to focus on camp. That's it. At the start of the year. Forget about all this. We just, or maybe we play badminton every Sunday. That's it. That's my, you know, my friendship building stuff. So whatever your resource can do, you focus on that. But the care groups carries through the whole year. Until evangelistic meeting. On evangelistic meeting time, in Gateway, our evangelistic meeting starts on Friday night. Because most of our packers are on Friday night. So our seekers are used to come out already on Friday night. So why not start it on Friday night? Because you bring them straight to the meetings on Friday night and bring them to Saturday, which is a weekend they can come, Sunday they can come, and then maybe uh, off Monday, off Tuesday, off Wednesday, and then start again on Thursday night and Friday night and Sunday. Do you understand? You make it as a convenient as possible for your for your seniors to come. And so during harvest time, even the cake will stop. Because all hands on deck for the harvest. Pathfinder stops, everything stops. Camp, all focus on the harvest. Because that's what the harvest culture is. And then when it's over, then we start cake again and we channel them back into cake. And we continue the cycle from here. Does that make sense? During Christmas New Year time, Sometimes people say, oh, people are traveling and our care group will be less people. Do you shut down care group? We don't. What we do is that we, we merge some care groups together yes. and, and let the seekers still have a place to go to. Even though the members may go on holiday during Christmas, New Year, or Chinese New Year time, whatever. So you, instead of three care groups, you merge down to one care group or whatever. But ensure that you still have a care group that's running year round through that. Like we have uh, student groups that will merge from two, three care groups, maybe down to one or two care groups. You know, depends. Two care groups merge to one, or two, one care group can, can join the other care group, whatever. You, you just need to manage the transition periods. All right, but always harvest time starts at a time when it's the most convenient for the seekers, which generally is when they used to go to care group. 80%, if you have this model, you will find that 80% of the people attending your evangelistic meeting are from your care groups, and they have a relationship already. So even then when they hear testing truth, they won't be so afraid. 
they want to hear from because they, they feel like, hey, but these people are real, these people are learning. Um, I know this is true, but what is it about, right? So it helps with the process. Question. Yes. Are you saying that the same for your February and April, you just do mainly so do you overlap with the time? It does overlap because Thai group is still running even during that time, right? But some Thai groups will be also being involved in this. They find new seekers into that Thai group. So actually, Thai group is running all year round. Even though I put Thai group, I'm more, I'm, actually there's Thai group here, here, and here throughout the whole time. So yes, when you're sewing, you can also be cultivating as well. But I'm, I'm saying that in every phase, this is the primary focus, even though you have other activities going on. So in this phase, cultivating doesn't mean that you don't sow. You can still sow, but your main activity here is cultivating relationships. So for example, when we do, for example, a care group retreat, maybe there's a long weekend coming up, and we, a care group is going away for a, a retreat on the weekend or whatever, right? Um, we encourage our care group to go away from um, Saturday afternoon onwards and stay maybe overnight Sunday and Monday is probably probably stay at night Sunday so they can have a care group camp together, right? 15, 20 people. Um, we try to encourage them to go after, after worship, rather than go on Friday night. Because we want to share to the seeker, we want to send a very powerful message to the seeker that is worship is important. Right? We don't want to disrupt worship groups. Worship is important. Otherwise, sometimes we get disrupted, worship get disrupted. If you're a small church of 50 to 80 people, you know, it's all juggling if certain people go away. So try to maintain that, and, and it also sends a powerful message to seekers that hey, our worships are important. Let's go after church. And we can all, if you if you're free, come to our worship group, and we go after church together. You know, so we invite them to come, and then we go on Saturday, we go on Sunday, we come back on Monday. And during this sort of camp around here in cultivate time, we generally do not in, don't invite new seekers anymore because we want to bond with those that we already have. You don't want to build enough strong. Because if you invite new seekers, suddenly you've got to cater for the new seekers as well as cater for the existing seekers, then your attention gets very divided. So if your cabinet has enough seekers, focus on the seasons that you have, build enough relationship, do a topic in a camp that they'll be of interest, and then lead them to evangelistic meeting to bring to a decision. Evangelistic meeting, picture work is this. It's like a pressure cooker pot. That's what evangelism meetings are. It's like a pressure cooker. You know, a body of truth is sent, is, is sent, message, the word of God is preached. The word of God is preached from meetings after meeting. The Holy Spirit is working. The pressure is building up. It's like pressure cooker pot, right? And at that time, I will tell you, when the Spirit of God and the, and the word of God is being preached, at that time, many decisions will be made. The pressure cooker is not as big in care groups or, it's, or in a bitter activities here and there. But in evangelistic meaning, it is a very big, big time. So you, we always need to bring it to a decision. It's an important part of the process. Okay. Any question? Is it clear? Any comments? Can you clarify anything? Yes. Actually, the mission has a plan to uh, organize community service like blood donation campaign for all the churches. You know, just like a collective effort of all. But the mission will be the one who will be organizing this. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is to generate uh, leads for the various churches to follow up. What do you think of that idea as part of the solving campaign? Well, if that's, your if, if that's the people group that you're reaching out to for your local church, and if that's the uh, part of your, your, you fed it into your cycle, and it's, uh, it is one of the vehicles that you think that is useful for your church cycle evangelism, then you can adopt it. Yeah. yeah. So some churches, they are too small to hold this kind of... Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, and, and, look, and you're doing a blood donation thing here, but if you don't have a follow-up in your local church, the next part of the cycle and the next part of the cycle, then you have to question, what are we doing? Remember, we've got to close the loop. If the loop includes blood donation, so what's next? What's next? What's next? You see, there's no end of ideas from any levels of the church, whether it be local church or mission or from union or division. I tell you, we have no end of ideas uh, in, in, in terms of outreach. We are always constantly developing new programs and ideas. The question is, what works for you as a local church? Because you are the local church leaders. 
You are the one where you are running the Thomas Enterprise and the hope of the world rests with you, the local church leaders. Not rest at the mission, not rest at the union, not rest at the division level. It rests with you, the local church leaders. And so you look at your cycle of evangelism and say, how does that fit in? My conference is the same. My union is the same. My division is the same. There are millions of, oh, not millions, I'm exaggerating. There are lots of programs that, you know, that is, that is given an idea. And I love the ideas they've been giving me. But I, as a local church leader, have to make a decision. Is that reaching my people group? You know, if my people group is uh, senior citizens, <coughs> This is going to blood. You know, do you understand? If I'm reaching senior citizens by people group, let's be clear, how does that fit in my cycle? If it's young people, yeah, young people give blood you know, as part of you know social uh, um, their social responsibility. And great, I'll, I'll get them involved in that. Do you understand? So you you think of your people group and you think about how does that fit in the cycle. That is systematic. Rather than haphazard trying to say, oh, it's not a good program, but we do not know how to assess how it fits in the church. But if you follow this method of knowing your cycle and knowing your people group, for example, we have many people group in a city, and you design a people group like uh, uh, look like this, then you say, how does that fit in? Should I adopt this union program? Should I adopt this woman ministry program? Should I adopt this uh, the community service program? Great. I don't have to do the work. The mission's going to do it, so I'm going to adopt it. Yeah, right. So, you know, you work with, work with as much uh, uh, your own knowledge, but you know your people group and then work on a plan. Use this method to assess. So, what I've given up to you was a piece of paper, and that piece of paper basically says, uh, get church leadership retreat planning session. And uh, this is one of the tools that we use in some of our church planning session. I'm going to talk a little bit about church planning session today as well. And what I do is that this is like an like a activity sheet. We divide them into groups of five, and we, move, and we go through it. Yesterday, I, I, I didn't have a chance to photocopy this, but yes, guess what you did yesterday. So, SI, SI analysis. SI means SWOT and improvement. I'm going to explain that later. Um, sorry, it means strength and improvement. From, from strength improvement analysis, it is evident we need to share a spirit like vision for our church. Probably as a church, we need to have a common agreed vision that we can work towards. All right, now, work out your people group and the reasons for it. Remember, we were talking about this, what are the people group, and then we worked out what is the close loop for the people group. So this is like a, you can keep this as a template, you can use it for other, is there some more? Anybody did not get a piece of this? Okay. And there's a couple of people here. Right. So you just uh, keep this as a template. It can be reused for any planning weekend in the church, all right? If you want soft copy, you can download on our website, David website, you can download this stuff. All right, so I will explain further. So for us, it's like even using health. Some people say, how can you use health at university? Because students all feel they're very invincible, you know, they, they, they can sleep, they can stay up all night, do a silent, eat, 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 uh, eat all sorts of candy and chocolate and drink lots of coffee and they still be fine. Uh, health ministry, ah, that's just for old people. Just don't use it in uh, student ministry. I tell you, it's amazing. We find health is an entering wedge. It's the right hand of the gospel. Young people are interested in health. You better believe it. Young people, you know, some of the jogging tracks, some of the gyms are full. We pull. Young people, they want to look good, feel good, you know, they want to build their muscles and so on. Right? So young people are interested in health, but the question is what kind of health program do you you know, no point teaching uh, diabetic, you know, care, and you know. Those are, young people say, oh, that's not my problem, you know. Talk to my parents, talk to my grandparents, whatever, <laughs> right? So you gotta look, you gotta go into the health program that means where they are at. So, um, for example, we run like a health expo, health screening at university, in a public university. So we have all our banners that describe the new stuff, you know, like you say trust, there's, there's uh, air and, you know, temperaments and, you know, we have different banners for the new staff, and we just show that up. We have a medical doctor that takes a final consultation. We do the height and weight, you know, body mass index, you know, we, do, we go through all that. Many of you familiar have Expo, right? Yeah. So we go through that to find contacts. And when we find these contacts, and we get to know them, and we give them literature and material, um, then we invite them to a university cooking school, right? Because students, you know, they eat out all the time, the food is oily and healthy and so on. So I say, Free cooking class. Want to learn? Want to cook like Jamie Oliver? <laughs> you know Jamie Oliver? 
<laughs> and, you know, the British uh, chef, the young chef. That, you know, when you watch his cooking, it's sometimes very headache because the camera just goes all over the place. And you know, it's more, it's a really cool sort of cooking thing. He cooked really fast. So what a good like Jamie Oliver come to this, you know, it's uh, free, it's uh, make, uh, make fast, healthy food. So we have it in our center, we've got Facebook, they can email in, you know, and we tell them where the map is and the location, right? So we invite them to build relationship. So from the Health Expo, you build relationship. But you know, if you want to teach cooking class, if you bring all the aunties and aunties to teach, sometimes it's very scary because they, the, the students don't have blender, they don't have these herbs, they don't, so the food that you, the menu you choose also got to be very relevant to the students. You cannot have 15 ingredients and the students will go like, oh, I don't know where to start. So confusing, this, this menu is too complicated, forget it. It's got to be so simple that they can cook like Jamie Oliver in 15 minutes, right? It's got to be like that kind of, so you even have to tailor the menu and the recipe that is healthy and useful. So, do you understand what I'm saying? The reason why we do that is because we are actually clear our people group that we reach out to. Sometimes we do cooking class general and expect everybody to come, young and old. You know, let's be focused. If you're reaching to young families, let's make sure nutrition as the recipes and the trim and the, and the talks and all that related to that. Your people group is clear. But if your people group is not clear, your cooking class will be not clear. Can you understand why this principle of planning is so important? Right, so after they've done that, you know our cooking class is really cool. What happens is that we have many tables with a stove, another table with a stove, another table with a stove. So the, the, the instructor teaches once, and then it's like a science classroom. Five students go to that table, five students go to the table, five students, and they cook now. The recipes are all there. So we watch them cook now. Practice it now. Don't go home and try. Do it now, here, yeah, right? So, and then when they finish cooking five different portions, guess what? They get all eat. get to eat. <laughs> Do you understand? So you even design your, your, your cooking school in a way that reaches your target audience. Does that make sense? Okay, so think about it, all right? Think about your people. Once you always customer focus, customer focus, you know what you're going to design. But if, if your mind is blown, oh, do I reach out to aunties, uncle, grandpa, grandma, diabetic? You know, your cooking school will be all over the place. It all starts with the people. Yeah. So, after that, we invite them to a better life. And also, look at the, the brochure. Who is it targeting? Colorful, bright. Yeah. You design even your brochure to match your marketing to match that as well. Why do you have Facebook? There's a reason. <laughs> yes. It's a type of group that you're dealing with, right? So, then, we, after the cooking school, we invite them to what? A better life, better future center which is our evangelistic campaign for that year, in August. So this was in July 29th, it commenced. And look at the picture, who does it appeal to? The same type of segment. So everything is focused. We're, we're not like haphazard in our ministry outreach, right? And then we tell them where we're going to be, add 10 years to your life, a vital statues not to be missed, have a spirituality information booth. You know, so when you come, you know, to this seminar, while you're waiting for the seminar to start, there's, there's chair massage offered to you. You can, you can sit down on a nice chair massage. Then there's information booth on health, you know, with all the banners when you start. And then they come to the first weekend. The first weekend we have a, a, a Dr. Jia, our medical doctor, who, who teaches health. And she will teach about health in three or four lectures. And then we say, come to the next weekend, because the next weekend is not just about better life. It's about a better future. What's the point of having longevity when the world is collapsing and when the disease and rampant everywhere? And you know, people say, what's the point of living a long life? I must well enjoy life now and, and have life to the max. Who cares? You know? But if they know the future, it makes life a different. So we put the health in the three angels message. In our jargon, it's health and three angels message. In the marketing jargon, it's better life, better future. Yes. And what is the most of your events? Yeah. Yes. Because we don't have a church. <laughs> um, it is, we, we run this, if what we, this program, the, the cooking school, is in our training center. Training center. Gateway training center. Yeah? And it's next to the university. We have a rented shop front in front of the university. And I'll tell you, it's a miracle why we can own it. We don't own it, we rent it year on year. And you know, for a ministry like ours, it's, not, it's a God's miracle that provides the funding for it. But we go by faith. That's happened. So, but for public evangelism, for gospel, 
we don't normally run it in church. We do not run in church. In health, yes, you can run it in our our sense. Because, um, but we also are sensitive because not every Taoist or every Buddhist or every Hindu will walk into a church. They will rather walk into a new program. So go to where they're at. In our case, they are here at the university. So we ran a place at the university to bring them here. So the principle is this. If you run a gospel program, um, try to find a new place. It works better. If you run a health program, you can run it in the church hall, but not in, probably not in the sanctuary, probably in the church hall or community center next to the church, that's fine. People don't mind coming to a church hall for health program. But for gospel program, no. We find it better run in public places, neutral grounds. Yeah. Make sense? Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions so far? Please ask. Yes. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, for the evangelistic meeting, uh, eighty percent of them usually are already in the CG. Okay? Yeah. So uh, why don't you hold it in the church because they are already attending some of them are probably attending church. Um, no, we don't, because we still want to reach the other twenty percent in the community. So for the sake of eighty percent, you want to. Get and but not all the eighty percent may have gone to church before. And they may not be ready to go to church. Mm -hmm. So we rather go in a neutral ground. Let's reduce the barriers of entry as much as possible. So that's why we rather hire a place uh, for the meetings. It might cost a bit more, but the results will be better. Yeah, neutral ground. You are blessed here in Penang because you got a hospital, you got a college here, you got neutral grounds already. Um, for other for other religion, this is quite neutral because. People come, people come to this hospital from all faith and all religion, isn't it? So you have a neutral ground already. Uh, for us, our neutral ground is a university, so we use that. Thank you. Yes? Do you have any points of the things that is making this proportion right? Instantly, that's the cooking or something, basically the thought that's the foods, right? Especially the nutrition, like the part, for okay. example, like the Korean food, they don't have it, like yeah, Korean okay. food, any part duration food to be more mesmerized, seems right, to be more organized, to organize the class succession. Okay, thank you. The, the question you ask is, do we have, um, say, maybe some of the uh, information for the food and so on? Yeah, just ask, uh, just, um, uh, you can reuse it. There's a lot of stuff that you can reuse, okay? So feel free to ask if you're interested to run like a, a cooking like Jamie Oliver, come and see us. We'll, we'll, we can even give you the brochures. You can, you can just change the names and the, and the maps and you just go around with it. No, no, no problems with that. You know? We are blessed in our church because we got graphic designers. Our young people use their gifts and their talents for God. So if you have people who do computers in your church, let the young people design this stuff. They know their segmentation. You know, I don't, my eyes don't look the way they see. So if you want to reach the segment, make sure you use that, uh, have the people who know that segment design and stuff for that. Thank you. All right. So after the Better Life, Better Seminar, uh, some people attend the, the evangelistic meeting in the, for the health program and then they run the uh, gospel program, the train your message. Some make decisions and they're ready to go into Bible studies and so on. Some are not ready. Some say that, oh, I, I need to know more. So you need to cultivate that relationship a bit more. So then we invite them to a health care group. Right, we have a health care group. We call it the Daniel Challenge. And the health care group, I told you already, um, if, if, if we need an iPad too if you, uh, if you finish the 10 weeks with us. So in the, in, the, in the 10 weeks of coming to our health care group, you apply the new stuff principle. If you, you, know, you keep a long book, if you drink your eight glasses of water, you get points. If you come to a meeting that talks about water, you get points. And if, if you do come to Sunday morning exercise, you get points, right? So you apply that uh, point system, and the person who finishes with the highest point wins iPad 2, right? Isn't it simple? This is so simple marketing, right? You don't have to print brochures, you don't have to print stuff. This is enough to attract people to come, right? So, because guess what young people want, right? You know, mini iPad, right? They, they want the latest gadget and so on. So you design to how you want to reach out to the community. And so, uh, Coming to the meetings of various people uh, for, that came to the meeting, I'll just show some picture of people. I want to talk about this girl. She came to this, uh, the Daniel Challenge. 
The Data Challenge, uh, the datachallenge.com, if you go to that website, the datachallenge.com, is a contemporary method to reach young people using new stuff. Uh, it's developed by Adventists and it's been used in universities and, and young adult groups all around. Uh, so if you, it, it got really cool videos um, uh, and so on and so on. So you can, you can go ahead and, uh, and look at that. Um, they even have videos of uh, Bill Clinton, why he moved to plant-based diets. Yeah, they have videos of different. So you can actually play a video segment and then do a talk. Video segment and talk. So it's pretty uh, contemporary and it's really a modern way of reaching the, the, the secular other population. So um, go ahead and um, uh, go down and have a look at that website. The DanielChallenge.com. The DanielChallenge.com. Maybe you heard of Creation? Have you heard of Creation uh, Health? Creation Health. That's another great website. So there are many good stuff out there. You know, some of them are so blessed, aren't they? We are so blessed about health message. You know, we should be singing louder. As Adventists, you know, and the things that we don't sing, and National, National Geographic has to sing for us, yeah. you know, and then Blue Zoom Book has to sing for us. You know, we have other people have to sing for us. We don't want to sing. We should be singing louder than anybody else. Amen. 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 That is the right arm of the gospel. We need to use it. All right. So this lady, she, this young girl, she came to the health program, and she was. When she signed up to this program, her main practice is that she wants to lose weight, to look good and lose weight. You know, girls always, the issue is losing weight. So that's the main priority she came. And she signed up for this program, she attended every week. She's a student at the university from Singapore, Buddhist background, big Buddhist altar in her main room in the family house. You know, she, when she came to this program, she started learning about new stuff. She learned about better life, better future. Um, and she began to come to Kagura. Week after week, she began to see people's life are different here. They see people with hope, people that don't worry about all the suffering that is leading to doom and calamity, people that have hope for the future. They talk about a person. This girl, she began to attend this uh, program, and uh, gradually, as she began to attend, she began to ask questions from a health perspective to a spiritual perspective, from a spiritual perspective to Bible studies, from Bible studies. She was baptized and I'm not sure. You know, so we praise the Lord. God is the one who does the work. She was sharing her testimony. Today, as a young student at the university, she ran the next outreach program. She ran the next sewing program the following year. And the cycle repeats. Amen? Amen. So God wants us to produce workers for the kingdom. Don't just baptize them, equip them. She's going through discipleship and so on. So, this is a, a quite an important process that we follow in church. People say, what do you reach the homeless? Well, as I said, you've got to do all this stuff to reach the homeless. So long as the, God hasn't raised the people in my church to do that, I'll wait. I'll wait for the Lord to be. So sometimes, we, our intention may be good. We look at all these people, we've got good intention, and Christians are very compassionate people. But let's be honest, what resource do we really have at this moment? I know we want to do it, but wait for the wait for the Lord to raise the resource. So you may mean well that you want to reach 15 people groups in your church, but that's not realistic. It's not going to happen. It is not realistic. It's more realistic that you would pick one or two people groups. If your church is about 120 people, two is max. You can do it effectively. But if the bring, if the but if the Lord brings the homeless people through through this this uh, student people group, and it can happen, we have seen it happen before. We have one auntie who is not even a student, but she was so happy to follow this process. <laughs> and she's got that she's in the church. You see, God's way, God has his own ways, you understand? But we do what we can at best. We, we, are, we, we focus on discipline, planning, discipline, time, and discipline action in our church. We do things with excellence as a church. The Lord will take care of the rest. Amen? And that's the way we should approach. So I hope this makes sense. Any questions so far uh, on on what I've covered so far? Yes. Uh, yes. We talk a lot about planning this mm -hmm. and that. Um, what happens if in our local church when we try to talk to the elders and they say, uh, "No need to plan so much. Pray about it." Second. <laughs> 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 Are we just not doing anything? Uh -huh. We just pray. Okay. So. 
so the, the question is, uh, if people say, don't worry about planning, the spirit will lead us, you know, we'll be spirit led and all that. It's like Nehemiah sitting in there and just pray, pray, just pray, 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 pray. And then when the, when the king comes, like, what do you want? I don't know, let spirit will lead me. <laughs> yeah. I don't see that in Nehemiah. I see that he planned, as he prayed, and when the king asked him, he already had an idea what he wanted to do. So, um, sometimes a couple of steps is required. Number one is that they, uh, we really need to have an opportunity to study the word with, with our friends in church. Um, we need the opportunity to study the word with them so that they see the principles of planning in scripture. Because sometimes all the words we convince them will not get through. Let the words speak to them. There's power in God's words. So if you want, give them the video. Let them watch the video. <laughs> That's fine. Number two, if they say, just pray about it, then you say, okay. Um, when will you and I pray about it? It's Santa o'clock on Sunday morning together, okay? Shall we come together to pray? Right? Because they, we talk about praying about it, but we don't just pray individually. Let's pray together. The church that prays together to go far in his ministry. So um, I think sometimes in prayer together we build trust with each other. Yeah. But I understand that power. It does exist. That people say, oh, you know, we don't have to plan. We just go by the Spirit and go by leading by that. Um, don't, don't plan so rigidly that you cannot let the Spirit change your plan. I, I, I believe in that too. The Spirit does change plans. I'm, I'm a believer in that point. But the vision doesn't change. The plans may change, but the vision will not change. Okay. Um, pray that God will give you opportunity to meet together. I don't think that you can ever change somebody's mind if they are not prepared to read the word themselves. We have to let the word change their minds. And so that's why I was, uh, what I teach you here, what I share with you here, uh, read use them, please. Just read, no copyright, you know. Study with them, and have my chapter one with them. Go through those principles, let them see those important points. And then the word will be clear because there's more power in that. Amen? Okay. Yeah. Good point. Any questions? Yes. You had a personal experience, like what he was just saying, though. Your church, you said, wouldn't listen. Mm -hmm. And so then what did you do? You went out and started the gateway. You know, well, I wouldn't say they won't listen. I think that the, they, were, they had fears that the, that the young people would be taken away from them and all young people would plant this new church. But the honest reality is that most young people stayed back and only a small number of young people went out. Um, they, that was their fear in their heart. And, but if the purpose and the vision is placed for soul winning, we're not dividing church because we don't like the worship style, we're not dividing work because we don't like your leadership. If the, if the state from the church is none of those issues, but it's for soul winning, I think the Lord will bless. And, uh, and so it's important. And then there will come a point in time that if your your the way who you are, and God says your people group is this. Let's say my people group is uh, young people, campus, and young adults. But my church, that's not their priority. My church is near senior citizens at home, and their people group is senior citizen. It will come a point in time where I will say, well, praise the Lord that they have that people group. Praise the Lord they're going to run all this uh, you know, program for the, the senior citizen to reach out to them. And I, I wish them the best. Because I can support initially for a year or two, but gradually, my heart will still be discontented. Like Nehemiah, my heart will be discontented. And, and God will say, Johnny, you're going to find other brothers and sisters with the same people group and band together and start reaching out to the area that God has placed you for. Then you will live the life to the full, to the abundance that God wants you to doesn't mean every now and then I can't help them when they're running a, a program for, for the aunties and the uncles. I will still help them. But I know where my heart is because I know what God has called for my life. So if we are not clear what God calls for my life, that's okay. Continue our journey and God will make it clearer as we hear His voice. That's why I'm so proud of the team that we hear His voice each day. Yeah. Yes, guys. Yeah. Uh, actually, continuation to Jay's. Question, right? Okay. Assuming that I have a program, yeah. I have my team ready, and I bring to a church board, right? Mm -hmm. And I get a no. Yeah. Uh, and we, the team, do it on our own. Okay. And despite, I mean, knowing mm -hmm. that the church does not agree. Yeah. Uh, they said originally okay. we do it in church. Since church said no, can we do it outside? Okay. With All the, the same vision. Yes. All right, thank you so much for that question. Alex and, uh, and Jay are asking a question for change management. How do we manage change? 
right? It's related to change. Let me cover the topic on change management first before I answer those questions. Otherwise, we'll be kind of like jumping all over the place. Is that okay? All right. Um, one of the area of, ma of managing change is communication. There is a need to communicate. And, um, and if we don't communicate, then we would have a problem. So, turn your Bibles with me to the book of Nehemiah. Again, our best MBA book in the world. Let's, let's go and study it, right? Nehemiah chapter 2. And let's go and look at the Word of God together. Nehemiah chapter 2. We, we go now to the place where he begins to... Um, Verse 10, chapter 2. We go to a place where he begin to take leave from the palace, and now, now he's going to manage a change management process. Chapter 2 is change management. Part 1 of chapter 2 is change management with authorities, which is the king. And the queen, the people in power. And remember, Artaxerxes was the one who stopped this project. Artaxerxes was the one that uh, did not want the, uh, uh, a rebuilding of the city. However, here you will find that Nehemiah was very wise in the way he used words, like he used the, the, the father's tomb. Remember what we studied that yesterday? He was very wise with the words that he used. He, he linked to the, the king's um, area of passion, which is the Persian area of passion. So when we want to communicate, we better know the audience that we're communicating to. Now, people are people in authority. If you are talking to elders or maybe church patriarchs and leaders that don't like change, right? But you need to know what is their passion. You know, maybe their passion is because they have built this church for all the rest of their life and, and their generation attend this church and they don't want to see this church destroyed by you multiplying another church, right? Then you've got to find a way to communicate to them that you're not trying to mock, not split this church. You're not trying to destroy this church. You're trying to grow the kingdom of God. So, let's take it from verse 10. When Sandalat the Haranoid and Tobia the, the Ammonoid, officials heard about it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. So, now we have another stakeholder in the whole story. And the stakeholders are who? Sambala and Tobias. Who are these people? Sambala and Tobias. Troublemakers, right? They are, are they Jewish people? They are from without, isn't it? They are from the hidden nation. And they have an invested interest that Jerusalem remain in ruins. They had, a, they had an invested interest in that because they were exploiting some things in that, uh, that land of the Jewish people. And so I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Then I rose in the night and I had few men with me. I told no one what my God has put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Nor was there any animal with me except the one which I rode. And went out by night, repeated word, I rose at night, and went out by night, through the valley gate to the serpent well, to the refuse gate, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates which were burned with fire. And I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. I went up in the night, night repeated word, by the valley, and viewed the walls. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I've gone or what I've done. I have not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the others who did the work. How many nights was mentioned here? How many days did he stay in Jerusalem? Okay, question. When he arrived in Jerusalem, how, what was the manner of his arrival into Jerusalem? Was it discreet? What did he have following him? Because he had the timber, he had the resources, he had, he had also an entourage to protect all that, to go through all the trouble areas, right? He got letters to go through the regions. Can you imagine the watchman on the ruin of the wall of Jerusalem? The watchman is looking up and he sees, because from Sush, from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem, it's a long, long trip. And he sees almost a camel trail. He almost sees an a, a, a entourage. And there are dust billowing out there. And there is like a royal flag. There's a royal army. Right? There is a noble man coming. Can you, can you visualize this? Right? On the walls, on the broken walls, you can see this, right? 
and they're saying something is happening. The, the rock, there is something coming into this, this broken down city. And my and our entourage came. But the Bible says something very interesting, very strange in verse 11. I came to Jerusalem and I was there for two days. It almost sounds like silence. Did you notice that? It almost sounds like silence. It almost does not make sense because in, in, the, in, the, in the commotion of the arrival of this royal party with the army and the entourage and, and all that, it's almost like there my came and all right guys, all to the stable, all us away, uh, park all the equipment there. If you are the rulers and the nobles and the officials in the city, what do you think you're thinking? They watch them and go like, hey! There's, there's, there's dust blowing out there. There's, there looks like a royal entourage coming. Uh, uh, call the officials. Call, call the royalty. Uh, call the rulers. And, and let, let's go meet this guy, right? There'll be some excitement. And then when they heard news, that they have eyes. Wow, look at timbers. Wow, great. We're gonna re all right. When are we gonna start the project? Can you see what's happening? The rulers and the officials are all excited, ready to go. Maybe you're the new pastor, and your family just came to a new town. Oh, we got a new pastor. We should be sending us a new guy. Oh, look at the wife. She plays the piano. Oh, well, look at the daughters. They can play the violin. Oh, great. Let's get them working in our church. Right? That's excitement, isn't it? But what did the pastor say? Uh, no, uh, Patrice, I hope you won't see me. <laughs> and at night, the pastor walked around the church. <laughs> pastor dragged the daughter and walked around the church. Can you visualize what's happening here? Does this make sense? This is, this is brilliant change management. Brilliant. You get it? Why? Why is it brilliant? Think of this carefully. Think of this carefully. There's this great... He's got all the letters, the royal letters to pass through the region. He's got all the authority and all the power. He's been appointed there for, two, for a 12 year period to run this project. He's got all the, the worldly authority to do this and all worldly resources to do this. But he came along and he stayed quiet for three days. Ah, my sister is right. What did he do? The assessment. He heard from Hanani and his brethren that the war was in disrepair, but he personally hasn't seen it. Sometimes when a new pastor, a new leader come to town, you know those like that? boys are very loud. Hey pastor, new pastor, come. I want to take you for lunch. Let me tell you what's happening in this church. <laughs> try, to, try to influence the pastor, get him on side. Can you see what's going to happen if Nehemiah did that? Nehemiah is smart. He's a brilliant guy. He's a brilliant change management. You can see. He, he wasn't ready to be influenced by these royalty, and these royal rulers, and the nobles, and all the, and the officials. He, he was letting them feel a bit what? Anxious. Getting them like, like anticipating like, what's going to happen? That's smart, isn't it? He, that's really smart. It's like getting them ready to go, but he's like, let's keep them on the toes for a while. You don't have to worry about it for a while. But then desire a change. Yeah. But then steal on it for a while. And so he brilliantly did not want to talk to all the officials. Because logically, if you're an official from the palace, the highest official of the city who want to have an address to meet you and to talk to you and so on. Right? That's the normal process. That's the normal protocol. But he didn't do that. The Bible says that he was there for three days. And he walked around the wall. Who did he walk around the wall with? The donkey. The donkey. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote on it, yes. And some parts he couldn't. He got to get off the donkey. Actually, by the way, you got to go to Jerusalem to see this. And you kind of follow the gates. And you kind of get a visual of it. You know? um, if you get a Bible map or go online, you got to see the visual. It's really cool. There's a reason for this direction and all that. Um, but in this case here, Besides the donkey, who else was with him? A few Americans. Who is this few man? Who is this few man? Trusted. Trusted. Besides trusted, what else 
did they have in that? Remember what we learned yesterday? Two or three witnesses, things are established, the scripture says. These are the same people with the same vision that God has read. This could be Hanami. This could be Hanami. I do not know. But the Bible doesn't say this could be people like Hanami that have come back and report and man have shared the vision. They have the same vision. God raised the same people and the same vision. And these few people walk around the wall. And they took the time to do personal assessment. Many times when we want to drive change in a place, we don't take time. Principle, time is required for assessment. Time is required for assessment. If we don't take the time and we are so excited, oh, God spoke to me directly, I've got a vision, I've got a 400% authority, I'm going to judge whether the pastor agrees with me or not. <coughs> you can have trouble. You can have trouble. We will take it away. Yes, even God may have spoken to you directly. Yes, God has spoken to or three people directly. But the, but the, the, the rulers... The church board is not ready yet. The officials are not ready yet. You understand what's happening? But they realize that you're, you're, you're taking time to assess and you're walking through the walls. And you're actually looking at areas where there is most broken, where there is more timber, where there is more... He, he's making personal assessment for the place. If you want to drive change, we need to personally... Principal number two, we need to personally see where it is not just hear from other people. Right? Too often we get influenced when we come to places. And we get influenced by others, especially if they like us, they're so loud, you know? They like to influence you with, with their opinion of things. And uh, we don't want that to happen. We want to be leaders. Leaders who see things through the eyes of God. Leaders who make their own assessment as God will speak to them. Right? So he went and walked around the walls, okay? And, and he went by night. Why at night? Nobody. Sorry. I suspect you are some, nobody else is seeing what he's doing. Nobody else is seeing what he's doing, yes? Okay. Three times the word night was used. The real picture is. The real picture is? Uh huh. Question. Why do we have walls around city in those, in those days? Protection. Security. Defense system, security. When are you the most vulnerable? You're vulnerable at night, right? So why do you think he goes out at night to look at walls that are for defense system? See the weaknesses. See exactly where the most vulnerable points are, where the most needs are. I mean, this is a change management chapter, isn't it? Isn't that true? Is, you don't have to study any MBA book anymore. Just read, read Nehemiah, right? If, you, if you're doing a church board, you better study together. Read Alamo's commentary on it, and you, you'll find a brilliant lesson in here. He walked around the walls where it is at night, the time that's most vulnerable, the time where security is most at risk, and he, he walked around to assess where is the area that's most needs. So that he, you know what, because everybody wants the timber. And the rulers control some part of the wall, say, my house is here, give me the best timber. Another ruler control another part of the wall and say, give me the best timber here. Right? Everybody wants the royal timber. Can you see what's happening? He's smart enough not to let that fight happen. He knows their invested interest. And then the, he knows the best way to assess is to go personally himself and see where the biggest point is. So that he knows how to fix his problem. I think that's really smart. Okay, let's keep reading. Wow, oh, my time is so short. And the officials do not know where I have gone or what I have done. Verse 16. I have not told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or others who did the work. Wow. I don't know how he had that brilliant knowledge, but he didn't even tell the priests. Did you notice that? He didn't even tell the priests. If you read the chapter 10 to 13, you know why. Because the priests themselves were colluding with the, with the hidden nations. So it tells me something's going on. The laudation was, it wasn't even laudation. It was almost beyond laudation. This is beyond lukewarm. This is, this is 
almost apostate situation here. This church is, is they are they are like going down such a terrible lifestyle problem they have there. So he had to walk by himself and he walked around the walls. Let's read further. Finally, in verse 17. Then I say to them, who is them? Who is them? In the context of verse 16. Come from 16 to 17. Alright, it's everybody, right? The priests, the nobles, and officials. Then I say to them, you see the distress that we are in? How Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Come let us build the walls of Jerusalem that we may long, no longer be a reproach. What kind of language did he use? Inclusive. Inclusive himself. Communication principle. Communication is the part of the Be inclusive. You elders are. Huh? It's your problem, huh? Hey, Pathfinder, why are you all like that? Like, we, we are, what is this we and her, them and us situation? It's a problem in the language here. But Nehemiah was good in communication. Was, was, was he lying when he says that we, you know, we are in distress. You see the distress that we are in? He wasn't. He walked the walks. He knew exactly it is. He knew exactly the problem and he exactly belonged. He owned that problem straight away. The other thing about walking the walls would make him own the problem. Otherwise, you become like an external official just giving direction. This is leadership. We need to walk the walls in leadership. Too often, we leaders, we get our mandate and our instructions, and we come in there, we think that we're Superman trying to make the change. God says, roll up your sleeves, walk the wall first, listen to the people, truly understand where the needs are. Don't drive change without listening. Don't drive change without observing where the weakness and the problems are. Don't be influenced by all these voices. You just go there and make your own assessment. Bring trusted men who have the same vision that you have, that God has raised up with the same vision to do the same. Consult with them. Okay? And then he gathered the people together finally. Then there's a second level of communication. So, firstly, we have a group of trusted people that he has worked with, and another level of communication. The other level of communication is we, us, we. Very inclusive communication languages. And that's the start that we should choose as leaders. Too often we try to put ourselves higher than everybody else. And Jesus said, let us esteem others better than ourselves. You know? Leaders are to be servant leaders, to be humble, to be there. And so we see that. Okay. And then verse 18, and I told them of the hand of my God which has been good upon me. And also the king's word. Okay, which one comes first? He told them about the king's words or God's hands first? Why did he do that? When he got this, all these letters, which is the royal mandate, the royal resources, the royal army, he had all this authority that he could shut under their face and say, you see the authority I have? You guys have to listen to me. And now I go to church for you see the money all I have? You better listen to me, I run this church again. <laughs> see, I own this building, right? You better. Leaders uh, are not to use that. That's the second degree. That was a blessing of God because the God moved the hand of our diseases. He came first and said, It's the hand of God in us. It's the vision of God that God's in us. So, what do you communicate? You use inclusive language, so what do you communicate first? Spiritual. From a spiritual perspective, what about a spiritual perspective? God is the authority. God is the authority. What else? You've got the glory. It is the. That's God's the omniscience. God is the one that gives the. The mandate. The mission. God is the one. Too often we, we use other mandates to try to lead churches. And this is a problem. This is a 
from. We use financial, we use our hierarchy, we use our social status, we use our other means to be changes. And that's not what God wants to use. Leaders should come with spiritual authority. But spiritual authority comes by leaders knowing the will of God. Amen? Yes. You want to know, I said to my young people, I like to see more young people to be elders in the church. But first of all, you need to have spiritual authority. And spiritual authority will only come when you have authority in the word of God in your life. You have wisdom. The word is applied in your life. You have wisdom. Knowledge is not enough. Understanding, not enough. I need wisdom. And I was that kind of person. He came with spiritual authority. God hand is upon this. God hand was the one that I that, that stirred my heart. God hands was the one that, that moved Artaxerxes. God hands was the one that set Queen Esther beside him. God hands was the one that allowed me to pass through the region. God's hands was the one that gave me all the letters to all the temples. He told about the goodness of God. He told about the vision that was given and God already provided all the things. You know, if you go and share this with uh, other leaders, uh, even though they are, you know, you know with the vision, the vision that God has placed upon a group of you, and that you can show that God's hand has been upon it, it's powerful. It's powerful. People cannot deny that God's hand is upon where you are. Because they're watching, they're watching with anticipation for three days, and uh, before that, they, for many days, they could see the clouds of dust coming towards the city. They could see they coming up the hill to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is on a higher plane, they could see all these uh, these uh, timbers all being pulled up there. They've been watching for weeks, and then and then when he arrived, he's, he's like, mm, don't say anything. And for three days, they anticipation, what's this all about? What this is about? That man is so smart. And finally, he says, God's hands is on his body. He allowed for a need to arise allowed to communicate this. Timing is so important in how we deal with change. And finally, he also said, the king's um, words that have spoken to me, let us, let us arise and build. Okay? He gave them a charge, let us. Let's go and do it together. And they set their hands to this good work. But when Sanballat, the Haranite, the Tobias, the Ammonite, and Gershom, the Arab heard about it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? You rebel against the king? You see, they're trying to raise up the old problem about rebelling against the king. So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will rise and build. But you have no heritage of right or memorial in Jerusalem. <coughs> Who will prosper them? Again, he said, Whether the, so every time when you communicate, the mandate is from home. Leaders, spiritual authority is your mandate. Not any other ways. Too many times I see in local churches the leaders use other kind of uh, mandate. I don't think that's healthy. I think it's healthy to see the call of God upon your life, the vision that God has placed upon your life. And when the vision is clear, the people group is clear, the, uh, you've been praying about it, you've been planning about it, that is clear. You just go share the goodness of God. That's what God is doing for that vision. Amen? Amen. So, simple chapter on managing change, but I'm coming back to the question my brother asked. There, you can see multi-levels of communication here in this process. So we need to communicate a multi-level. First of all, is that group of, when you go into a place, you want to drive change, look for the two or three weaknesses that God has put upon your lives as well. Moses, God gave him Aaron, I think Miriam. They got together. They traveled all the way to Egypt. Right? They, uh, Aaron, spokesman for Moses and so on. There's a team that God always raised. So you just look for that for the moment. Maybe your church is not ready for change yet, but you look for the two or three people. That God has the same people group, God has placed upon their heart of burden, God placed upon their heart of vision, you want to do something about it. Pray together, pray together. And time, time will come where God allows you to communicate to the authorities, the rulers, the nobles, the officials. Right? It could be a church board, right? So if the time will come, they will allow that to happen. And when you communicate that, don't communicate that like, oh, if you guys don't want to do it, I don't care, I'll find it myself. Yeah? Don't communicate like that. You better be clear that it's a mandate of God when you communicate this. And share the goodness of God, God's hands upon everything through the whole process so far. And say, this is where the Lord has put upon our heart to go and move forward. Sometimes I see proposals in church board, they're more like, a, like running a business proposal. <laughs> You know, 
I mean, I know we need to have discipline in making business proposals, but we're going to have a spiritual, we, we need to first of all to have a spiritual element to this proposal. The business side will come. That's just the discipline of cost benefit analysis, financial planning, budgeting, those will come. But let's have a clear mandate from God in how we do our work. Amen? Yeah. yeah. So, when you see this uh, change, I, I would encourage that we seek counsel. Um, if, they, if you're the only one with this vision, you're the only one with this people group, wait, wait. Pray that God will raise other people. Don't go around lobbying. Don't go around lobbying in the church. It's your effort. Pray that other people have the same vision. And pray that God will bring that person with the same vision to come with you, to, to, to talk to you. You'll be surprised. When you pray, the other people say, I've got to say better too. And they talk to you. You're like, wow. That's exactly what we've been thinking about. That's God's that's spirit like. Amen? Amen? And then you talk together, you, and then you know who they are, like-minded people, you pray together. Pray together. When the opportunity arises that you can present to the church board, or to maybe the personal ministry department, or the evangelism department, <coughs> or the youth leaders, whatever, you present it. And share with them what God has been doing in your life. And that's the key. How we move forward. Then we will reduce some of this corporate style of approach in our churches. We do all this too often, we can get a lot of bruises, you know? And people say, oh, you reject my proposal? Oh, don't attend this church anymore. You know, you get, you get all kinds of, I don't look at you, don't attend the same service class you anymore. You know, you become all this tension that is very unnecessary. So, we've got to operate the way that God wants us to operate. So, how do we communicate to level one? And after that, how do you communicate to the board, to the leaders and so on? So in our church, the elders and the pastors, we will pray and ask God to give us direction and vision as a group of people. And as we pray, God will give us ideas and so on. But we need to bring the church board together with this. So how do we get the church board together on the same page? Because not everybody in the church board will be on the same page. So I want to share with you a method, okay? I'm talking about not principle now, I'm talking about method that we have found useful to bring along leadership to the same decision. All right. And so how do we form this um, vision and values? Okay. We go away what we call on a leadership retreat. Okay. Leadership retreat. Okay. It's not in your notes, but you just... Uh, I think it's in your notes in a small area, but you have to... Yeah, point number eight. But you probably need to write a bit more of this. Uh, in the leadership retreat, I'm going to talk about uh, the church board and the invitees. Uh, the, it's a weekend away after church, after worship time. We have pre-reading materials, we have an agenda, and we have deliverables, and we have follow-up action by the church board. These are the components that we run in our leadership retreat. Yeah. All right, so not just the church board only, but some invitees. There's a reason for that. I'll explain later. It's a weekend. Normally, we start on uh, Sabbath afternoon and finish Sunday afternoon. It's only just one overnight stay. Pre-reading is given up two weeks before, two or three weeks before. Very important. Pre-reading is like reading material to frame the mind and the thinking and give some data and some information. We need to have a discipline process here. Agenda for the weekend, things to deliver. We have three outcomes, what we're going to achieve on the weekend, and then what follow-up we need to do. No point going away on the weekend and you don't do anything about it after that, right? So we need a follow-up. Right. Is that clear? Can I go on? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, who? Church board members. And this time we also include the spouse. We include the spouse. Um, there's a reason for that. If the spouse will attend, because sometimes it's not possible with the children and all that. But um, we like to include the spouse because the spouse are very much part of the same ministry. You know, even though you may be a personal ministry leader, but your spouse may be very involved in it too. You may be part of the leader, but your spouse is involved in that too. So we try to involve the spouse if that spouse is not on the church board as well. Um, we recognize that not all board members will attend because it's very hard to get everybody on the same weekend. But you got to make sure you get the key people there. You know who they are. They're not the legats, but they're the leaders in the church. You know who they are. You want to get the key people there. All right? Um, check their schedule in advance. Normally, we would do this around October in our schedule, September, October in our church schedule. Once a year, we do this. Not every weekend, but once a year. All right? We also invite one or two other people. These one or two other people could, may not be on the board, but you know who they are in your church. They are quite key. 
You know some people they are very active in church and they are actually quite very influential but they say, oh, but I don't want to sit in the board meeting, I don't have time to sit 3 hours, 4 hours board meeting. You know who they are? Uh -huh. You need them on these meetings. You need them on this weekend. Just say, come on, we are not asking you to come every Sunday for board meeting. This is just one time in a year. Please come, we need you there. Of course, you run the names of the invitee to the church board and say, can we, can the board please authorize these two additional people to come? Don't do it unilaterally as a pastor and elder. Make sure you get that agreement and you share why you want this person to come. Oh, yeah, we need this person because uh, the, our children ministry is so important. This lady has been fantastic and organized. She's visiting on the moms and all. We need somebody like her on this meeting. Please, and you want, please approve that she could come as well. So bring that proposal to the board. Okay, there are spiritual leaders with a sense of vision, have a burden for people in the church, and they will add value to the leadership retreat. One of the invitees you may invite is maybe an external facilitator. Maybe you have somebody from the mission, maybe somebody from a ministerial director, maybe you have uh, a pastor from another a neutral person, maybe you have uh, uh, somebody who is good in facilitator skills that you might need to help you to facilitate the meetings in your in your meeting. Maybe there's a, a church member in your your congregation that is actually a consultant, works for KPMG or works for uh, Ernst and Young or, or IBM that do consulting work and do this sort of facilitation work, right? And you might want to bring that in to be a facilitator through the whole program. And because they will help facilitate the process. They've got professional skills that you may need for the, for the weekend. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Well, of course, look for people who are church. All must be Adventists. All must be committed Adventists to come with this leadership retreat. You, know, you don't just invite an, an external facilitator from you know, a non-Christian background just to facilitate. That's not acceptable at all. Must be an Adventist. Who understand the mission of the church. Right? Well, uh, why? Because it's a time to pray together and ask God's leading. A time to be awake and plan together and to build team spirit in the leadership. Too many times on church board, we only just meet to make decisions. Sometimes we only meet to argue. You know? We want church board that means that they know each other, they love one another. It starts at the top. If the church board doesn't love one another, why do you expect the church to love one another? starts at the top. But sometimes we're so busy we don't have time to bond together. We're too busy. So this weekend is a very powerful weekend. We've been running this year <coughs> the ministry. I have actually facilitated some church board in doing this and, and, and helping them on a weekend away. And we have seen tremendous change. Uh, we've seen uh, bridges being built, forgiveness made to one another. It's just a powerful time of prayer. And I just highly recommend this process. Alright, uh, when? On um, Sabbath afternoon. Uh, after church worship. You don't want to do it, you don't go away Friday night. Imagine the whole church board leave the church and go and have worship service. How does that look? It looks terrible, isn't it? It basically says that your church worship is not important. This retreat is more important. No, worship is always important. Yeah, so that's why we always preserve worship in our church. Even if Kegel wants to go away, we say no, after Saturday. After, Saturday afternoon is fine. Because worship is important. Yeah. Read Revelation 4 and 5 and see how the angels worship God. You know, only we can worship like that. You know. Where would be the day is to go to heaven and see the angels worship? Wow. Um, once a year? Where? Not in the church. Please, don't run, don't run your leadership between the church. <laughs> go to somewhere fresh. You can open your mind up to think. Go up to uh, you know, a place, an off-site location, no more than one and a half hours drive. Because it's sad if you don't drive too far. Right? Don't make it a three-hour drive and be so tired after finding, after doing your Friday night care, you're rushing more for morning Sabbath school, cooking for church, and then going for worship, and then, oh, we're going to drive three hours to go this. Nobody will come. So, practically, one hour, one and a half hours in the countryside. Okay? Um, we fund it as a church. We get a country house or we get a, 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 a location like a, like, a, like a campsite or whatever. All right? That's where we, we, we as a church will fund it. Uh, because we believe in this and we believe it's important enough that we will fund it as a church. Uh, we don't charge the, the leaders to come for this program because this is too important. But if your church don't kind of afford it, maybe the leaders can put some money into it. That's all right. right? That, uh, we took that approach, but you may choose a subsidy model, whatever you choose that is suitable for your church finance. Okay. Pre-reading. Uh, we have pre-reading material that's given to the uh, participants. 
And it's prepared by a facilitator and a pastor and the elders and the leaders for... They need to read this before coming to the leadership retreat. And what are some of the material? The, the material mainly is, is a tool to raise the temperature for change. Isn't that important? We need, we need information for people to want to make change. Nehemiah says, I walked around the walls. Let me tell you on this side near the refuge gate, the, the wall is all the way down at this level. The enemies can even just, just one step walk into your building. Nehemiah could describe the details because he's walked around the wall. We need data to drive change. If you, if you want to make change, you need information. Imagine publishing your last 10 years baptism uh, result and your retention result. Imagine making that available to all your leaders. Name all the people that were baptized in the last 10 years and name those that left the church. What page? Send it out to your leaders. What do you think they feel? <sighs> that is my friend. That was my uncle. That's my that's my nephew. You know what I mean? It's te- it raises the temperature. Imagine publishing uh, your your Sabbath school statistics. Count the people that come at eight thirty. <laughs> Five, seven, nine. Now, publish that data. Why are we afraid of it? We all want good news, don't we? We all don't want bad news. If you want to see a doctor, you better get the real news. Right? So we want to get the real news. So publish on this. But don't publish just doom and gloom. Publish hope as well. Give them some case study. Give them some church case studies. Give them some, uh, um, some um, uh, results in other places and other models. Uh, get them to read. I like to get them to read Spirit of Prophecy. I always, uh, I might take out extract from Testimony Volume 9 to get people to read. Uh, I might take uh, church growth materials that are, uh, some of the church growth material on our church history is fantastic. <laughs> if you want some of this pre-reading material, come and see me, I'll give you a whole set of it. Um, church growth material of the days of Jane Andrews, S. N. Haskell, all our pioneers uh, church growth studies. Fantastic reading. You don't want to miss that. And uh, uh, work done by A.G. Daniels. Do you know A.G. Daniels? A.G. Daniels was the general conference president during the final years of Adam White. A.G. Daniels was an incredible general conference president. Uh, and he, he's an Australian. And he's one of the first Australian general conference presidents we have. And, but he had a vision like no other. And he was so well resisted by so many things. So read some of his books uh, by A.G. Daniels. That's amazing. Uh, so I will give materials like that for them to read, to prepare their hearts before they come to this. I will give them some church data for them truly to see where our church really is at, rather than just come with all information. All this is preparing the mind towards the retreat. Because if you don't prepare the mind and prepare the information, everybody will be arguing from a different database. We all must come from the same common database. Right? Okay? Common patient database. No, sorry. Uh, no, single point of truth. Right? This is a common issue. In churches have the same problem. Pathfinders say, oh, we are going well. Look at all our Pathfinder master guides. Look at all our results. You know? No, no. Let's look at the whole church data. How do we really look like in the last 10 years? Years. Okay. If you, it's not hard to get the data. You just need somebody to work on this data uh, in your church. The church class should have it. You should have reports in the mission office. You should have reports the data somewhere. Gather that. Hey, you've been in church for 10 years. You know who got baptized in the last 10 years. Try the session report. Yeah, you got lots of stuff. So there's a lot of things available. But, but you want reports that really raise the temperature for change. Not just any nice, wonderful, beautiful, you know, blurry report. You, you are really reports that work, that get people to think. So, it gets the participants to start praying over things before they come. Start giving them prayer requests to pray for the meetings, to prepare your hearts for the meeting. Does it make sense? Is that clear? Okay. So, what do we do? This is a, a sample agenda. I want to run you through the agenda, what we do in the meetings, so you get an idea. And I hope this is, this is something very practical and useful. We've got, we don't have time to go through. So we start off at uh, 4.30, for 15 minutes, we have a prayer and welcome and objective, all right? And then we have a study on uh, a Bible study. In this case, I was doing a parallel between Nehemiah and the church. So we did our local church and the passage in Nehemiah. And then we will spend uh, 30 minutes of uh, Bible study. Then we'll do what we call SI analysis, strengths and improvement analysis. Uh, have you heard of SWOT analysis? Yes. Yes. You have done SWOT analysis. Okay. 
All right, I'm just talking about strengths and improvement. I'm not talking about strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats. I'm just talking about strengths and improvement. I'll tell you, I, I used to do SWOT, but now I do SI analysis. Right? I'll tell you a reason why later. <laughs> um, prayer time, we, we divide the prayer groups. And we break up a group of prayer, then we have dinner. We close Sabbath, there's a devotional message by a pastor. And then we have prayer time one by one, one on one, pair of people to pray. Then we do an exercise called Focus on Vision and Values. This is a, like a facilitated activity. Then we have prayer time again by ministry group. We go to the same group, we pray together. And then the next day, Sunday, we have a morning walk, early morning walk. We just want to go for a walk. And then we have a devotional again. And then we have self prayer time for yourself. We have breakfast, and then we have other activities as well, which is dealing with different uh, things that we work with. This is breakout groups again, and then we close, and then we finish. That's what the schedule looks like. Did you notice, what do you notice that's very common through the whole agenda? Prayer. That's the key. Prayer in groups, prayer in pairs, prayer individually, prayer in ministry groups, prayer in you know, we just have different types of prayer, group prayer, conversational prayer, and so on. Very key. And then activities are like the things that I shared with you. These are activities worksheets. So, uh, so we do something called an SI analysis, strengths and improvement analysis. I want to show from show with, to you how strengths and improvement analysis can help with uh, uh, finding out what are the values of the church. Okay. Remember we talked about vision and values, right? People say, how do you develop vision in the church? How do you develop values in the church? I want to show you how these uh, worksheets will work in developing those in your church. And this is a facilitated process that you will see that they discovered. Now, I used to do uh, SWOT analysis. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong, I don't think it's wrong, but I, I have a preference to do SI analysis. Because SWOT says strength, weaknesses, opportunity, and threat. Uh, when I see God as a God of excellence, and God is awesome and powerful, and the church is the apple of His eye, and the church is His agency to reach soul, I don't see any threat. I don't see any threat. Uh, in my view, because I see that the, the kingdom's purpose goes beyond this. He has victory over any the enemy's threat, to be honest. Amen? Uh, I also noticed when I read Albert Weiss' writing that. Um, we, we should not utter words of discouragement. Do you remember that quotation? We are not to utter words of discouragement. Weaknesses tend to point us into areas of discouragement in the church. So, I, I used to do SWOT analysis as a facilitated process because I've done that in corporate life and I'm so used to that, to do that. But when I tried that in church several times, in several consulting for churches, I realized that the discussion deteriorated into discouragement. <laughs> because you imagine coming to a meeting, people got hobby horse project and problem in their mind. You know, they got they, they want to jump on the soapbox and yell and scream because finally there's a leadership retreat. I'm going to save my peace of mind here, right? So you know, there's different types of people that come to the leadership retreat. So you you know, if you focus from a negative point of view, what would happen? It would it could drag it down. I'm not saying that your church is like that. Your, you guys probably can do SWAT because your church are all nice and people love each other, right? They're very friendly. So you don't, you don't have that problem with that in your church. Yeah, yeah, lovey dovey church, right? Yeah. My church maybe wasn't like that. So I knew I needed to change it to SI analysis. So I use that. I also read, you know, when Sister White tells us clearly, you know, we should not have the words of discouragement in the church because that's not God's desire. God wants us to be focused. So I changed the process to strengths. Yes, strength is great. Start off the meeting with strengths because it is good to talk about what we're good at. And it lifts the spirit of people in there and lifts up hope in that meeting. And then we talked about improvement. Improvement is good because we focus on the solution rather than keep dwelling on the problem. Right? Because sometimes, you know, when you discuss weaknesses, it could drag out. The, you, know, you can't do it over the weekend. It can, it'll take you three weekends to talk about weaknesses. Right? <laughs> people, people got their complaints, you know. They, they want to yak and yak and yak about their problems, right? So I want to stay away from that because I don't want to drag the leadership meeting down to that kind of gutter level. I want to stay up here and, and look out forward to hope and to future. So we focus on improvement. How do we improve? No point. When we talk about improvement, of course, at the back of people's mind, they know what the problem is. But we don't need to utter those discouragement. We don't need to. We need to talk about moving forward. So as a facilitator, this is what we can. 
our objective here is to point people forward because Jesus is the head of the church. And he's the, he, he is the one who is the general that leads the church. And if he leads the church, then we go with his, his drum beats. And we go with the way he approaches things. And if Jesus is the type of person, I believe when you see, did he ever sit down with the disciples and do a SWOT analysis? <laughs> Have you ever read anywhere Jesus say, oh, you came back from the mission trip, this is your weaknesses, you know? You, you don't do it this way. I don't see that. I see Jesus talks about strength, Jesus talks about the improvements. So, when I study scripture again and look at this corporate method that I used to use, I, I realized that I want to put that method to the test of scripture. And, and see when, anywhere in the passage of scripture that we ever do this sort of thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? So don't get don't don't be offended if you did sort of analysis. I, I don't want you to feel like I'm like looking down on that. I'm not. I used to do that, and it may work for your church because people are very friendly and happy together. Um, and my church wasn't, so I needed to do something different. And I searched scripture and I, I did this sort of analysis approach. So I hope you understand that. Okay. So take the results that you've done. Use those results that you've done. Don't feel that you have to throw it away and start again. Uh, but I just want to show you another method that I think uh, could apply, could apply, if you think so, all right? So let's have a, a few more questions. Is there any questions? Of, yeah. What are the indicators that you took there? Are they yellow and the red and all that? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to come back to that because the method that we use is, um, uh, okay, the colors represent something. Um, we call it scan, focus, and act, all right? Because when you do a facilitated uh, process like this, you need to scan the big picture. What's the issues? What are the strengths of the church? What are the areas of improvement? Scanning. Then you need to focus on the things you're going to work on. Then you need to turn the focus into action. Yeah. Scan, focus, and act. Scan, focus, and act. It's actually a, it's a consulting methodology. Uh, if you work for EY before, you know what it is. Yeah. Um, I used to work for consulting, so <laughs> I've done this something. But, Again, like I say, uh, some methods are good, but we need to just assess that in the description. All right. Yes, Pastor. How big a group do you take up for the weekend? How big a group? Um, I don't know how big a church board is, um, but um, 20? Excellent. Yeah, 20 is fine. I can work with that. Yeah. Not too many. Not too many. 15 is all right. 10 is okay. Yeah. Depends on your church board. Some church board has, uh, I, I've been, I did some work at one church in Sydney, they had like, wow, nine elders in that church, you know, plus they have stars, there's already 18 people. <laughs> then, you had the, then you had the other ministry, that's a, a lot, right? So you gotta, you got to watch it. If your church has, uh, if your church, if the group become too big, then maybe you don't invite the stars this time. Uh, you just have the board members come home. All right, so it is a bit of a sacrifice for our church leaders to go away on a weekend because it's a, it's a weekend away from their family and their kids. I understand that. And I know that uh, it is a sacrifice on their part. That's why we, as a church, don't want them to pay for it. We will pay for it to buy that car. And we choose quite a nice place. You know, a reasonable place. Not like a staying in bunks in a, in a tent, in a camping, so like, in a rough house. So like, uh, it's a nice country resort, you know? And then, uh, and sometimes we have the spouse come, which is great because they can also help with the cooking. And while they are leaders of fighting, the spouse can help with the food and, and all that sort of stuff. But we keep food really simple in this sort of process because we don't want to be bogged down with the logistics. So even if we're just having um, uh, uh, like a simple dinner, like a salad and pasta for dinner, that's all we do. Uh, or we, normally we just say potluck, bring, some, bring a dish and we do the Saturday night that way. And then Sunday we do pasta and salad. That's, so we try to keep food really simple to know person. But 20 would be a good number. 25 you can work with it, but it's challenging. Um, but 20 would be a okay size to work with. Yes? Um, I don't know some phone name, but mm -hmm. why is it encouraged to bring the spouse? Oh, okay. Why we bring a spouse? Because many times in ministry, when the, when the, when the spouse goes to bed and he sleeps next to his husband or his wife, they talk about church stuff. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know that board meeting I attend. So hard to get things through. And as far as ah, it's okay, next month you try again. You know, there, there's actually a lot of interaction between spouses, whether you like it or not. They're actually also quite integral in serving ministry together. I see that in churches. I don't know about your church, but in my church that's the case. So we we see them as team of ministry. They feel yeah. a bit, they feel apart. They feel definitely they feel apart. Yeah. So I, I see the value because they are team ministry. The Bible says two shall be 
one. And it's each of so that's the reason why we bring a spouse brother. Not because we want to discriminate the singles who don't have spouse to bring. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just want to recognize that the spouse actually contributes a lot to the ministry as well. But that's if you've got a small church board. If your church board is like 10 people and you have five spouses, 15 people, that's all right. But if your church board is 20 people and you add another 20 people, then you really can't run this retreat. It's way too big. You know, 25 is max, max. 20, okay. More next time. So you look at your church board. I don't know what your church board is like. Yeah, question. We are very blessed in our previous church in KL mm. to have run two yes. uh, retreats like this. Yeah. Uh, we just learn my mistake, but essentially our first retreat was something like what you just shared. Yeah. It was after church and things like that. And we were very loving that people. Yeah. So we did SWAT and it was great because people were very objective and focusing on the weaknesses. Yes. Anyway, so it was really well and we came up with vision and uh, mission which we all felt part of. Great. Moving on three years, yeah. we had a new board already. So we tried to do the same thing, but we did not get a chance to go out to a different place. So we did it at one of the homes. Yeah. And uh, this time we had someone who, uh, the first round we did, it was someone inside the group mm -hmm. who facilitated. Yeah. Second round we had someone who was very experienced from one of the multinationals and he, we asked him to get out. Yep. Um, but the second time, I don't know why, uh, we just could not uh, get agree on the vision and on the mission. We even broke it out into two separate or three separate sessions, but it just did not work out. So. Uh, you shared in the beginning about the role of the facilitator. I feel that looking at even at the mission, uh, every church will struggle to find an objective, spiritual facilitator. And if you don't get the right person, the church will just going to be arguing and it could be even worse. Uh, any wisdom on that? Thank you for your observation. That's so true. That's so true. Finding facilitators is not easy. And that's why. But in, if you have churches where you have people who are in your board that can facilitate, let them facilitate. It's okay. That's no problem. An elder can facilitate. A pastor can facilitate. We can do that. If we have people that have those skills, facilitation skills. Um, bring an external facilitator who don't know your church, who don't know the mission of your church. It's a very steep climb for them. It's a very steep climb for them. But the, the thing is this. Look for first... A, a person that's willing to pray with your team first. That's going to be the key. It's not going to be their skills. It's going to be the spiritual vision. Spiritual outlook that's going to be the key. So, um, try to do it internally with your own resource if you can first. And uh, in Australia, I guess we're, we're blessed. We've got a few pastors that used to come from uh, consulting background in Australia and they became pastors and so on. So we have we are blessed to have those sort of uh, resources in our conference. But not every church has that, not every mission has that. So if you don't then I think internally it should be okay. Uh, the facilitator is not a role that just to be neutral, you know? That's not the role facilitator here. It's more to keep the schedule and keep things going along. They can participate. They can give their thoughts and opinions and so on. Why not? They're your board. They're your board members. So you're not trying to arbitrate between, this is not an arbitration weekend, right? Between one camp and the board, this is another camp. This is, this, is a, this is a process where the facilitator is moving things along. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't use it with an arbitration. It sounds like there's a legal matter going on. So, just so, sorry, let me finish. So, try not to worry about um, the perfect person to facilitate this. Um, get a person who can manage time and manage processes and just move forward. So if you can uh, not find that person, then um, it shouldn't still stop you from running this. Between the leaders, you can, should be able to run this. Um, an external facilitator, the problem is that an external facilitator may or may not know where you're trying to ultimately get to. And, uh, and they're just playing their role as an external facilitator. But if somebody got skin in the game, meaning they're part of the same board, then they will be keen to come and get to an outcome. You know? But I tell you, sometimes our leadership retreat does happen where we don't have an outcome. But we actually do. We pray together more. And sometimes that's what's necessary. Because God says you're not ready yet. It has happened to me a couple of uh, leadership meetings ago where God says, not ready yet. You guys are still in three different camps here. 
and you're too self-focused, and you think you think you're success, you think you're so successful, you haven't depend on me. Mm. God says, nothing will come yet. Wait, keep praying. And that's happened to that process. So don't be discouraged if you don't have an outcome that day. Sure. But I tell you, you still have an outcome. You pray together. And that's the point. Yeah. Back to the experience of Levi and fast and pray. Do we need to do that the week before this kind of meeting? Yes, if you could. Please, uh, we set aside days for fasting. For example, uh, Wednesdays for fasting days. And we, we will prepare our people and our heart for going to the meeting. So fasting is very important. Uh, as a part. Even before we do our evangelistic series, we have fasting days. Uh, before we do our um, any major thing, whether it be AYC or any major program that we run in our church, we call the people to a fast. Because it's a corporate thing to do. Uh, I don't know whether your church uh, practice fasting, but uh, individually I, I personally do, and I think it's an important thing. Uh, and I think it's important thing that the church practice that too, to bring the church along. Don't make it mandatory. Not everybody can because they got, may have medical conditions that they can't fast. Make sure you send out enough medical uh, information to help those who want to fast but don't know how to do it. You know, make sure you educate about fasting. It doesn't just happen. There are you need to give out some information how to do that. Yes. Ask about this No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, the facilitator is not there to arbitrate, the facilitator is more to get the process going. So it can be somebody in the church. They are not necessarily a person that, you know, like in business we try to bring in external facilitator because we got department A in this silo, department B in this silo, they're fighting each other, so the facilitator seems to be neutral to manage the consulting process. Uh, but in church it's not like that. In church we are one body. And if we are one body, we got hands, we got legs, all have different gifts. If there's some people in your church that can help the process going and understand this process, understand time management, get them to me to facilitate. In fact, as a facilitator, they should be able to offer thoughts and ideas as well, contribute to the discussion as well. They shouldn't be like locked out like, oh, your facilitator is supposed to be neutral. It's different when you're in a church boss situation where the pastor or the chair of the board needs to be neutral because you're dealing with proposals and dealing with financial decisions and you need to be able to arbitrate decisions in the church. That's a different process. This is a process of bringing the church together in prayer and together towards uh, an outcome. All right? 